If you're new, uh, we've started a series called I Wish Jesus Never Said That, and so we're looking at some of the most controversial things that Jesus said um, and some of the things that are really hard to, to, to chew or to swallow or to understand. But, but Jesus being God himself, his words are life-giving, and so if we really take heed tonight, I believe that we will indeed grow as followers of Jesus. And if you're here and you are not a follower of Jesus yet, I hope that you'll be compelled by what he says here tonight. So as we kick off tonight, I want to pose a question. Um, in the past, has there been a single person or something that you have found really difficult to let go of? Not because you really wanted to let go of that person or thing, but because you knew, just deep down in your heart, you knew it was the right thing to do. To cut people or things from our lives, friends, is extremely difficult, especially when we become so attached to them. You know, loose connections are easy to cut off, but tight connections aren't as easy. And deliberately cutting off people or habits or things in our lives is an extreme action. We must admit that, but the extremity of the action, friends, always reveals the gravity of the situation, and we need to bear that in mind, and that, ironically, is actually where both the problem and the solution lies, because once you realize, friends, the gravity of a particular situation and the problem that a person or a thing is posing you, you will do whatever it takes. You will literally do whatever it takes to bring a resolution to that problem, because desperate situations require desperate measures, but here's the catch. Only if you recognize that the situation is desperate. Only if you recognize that the situation is desperate. I don't know how many of you have seen the movie uh, 127 Hours by Danny Boyle. Uh, it was a, uh, no one? No one really watches movies? Ah, oh, some have, okay, cool. Uh, it came out a few years ago. It was Oscar nominated. It was starring James Franco and it was such a powerful movie because it was depicting a true life story of an avid adventurer and he was a dude who liked to go off into the mountains uh, and, and hike and climb and, and go biking as well and so uh, this was part of his life um, and one day he decided to go on one of these trips but he did not tell anyone about it because uh, the reasons are unknown but he decided to just go off on his own and then uh, during his trip, during this adventure, he found himself lodged in between two crevices of two cliffs uh, and he couldn't let himself go. He couldn't, he couldn't wiggle his way out because somehow his arm, I think it was his left arm, was caught in between the cliff and a rock. And so he was completely stuck and minutes became hours and hours became, became days. And by day three and four, he was getting really desperate and so uh, he was running out of water. He even had uh, a small little camera phone type thingy that he just placed in front of him by his other loose or his free arm. And he was starting to give a message to his parents. Um, you can actually find that on YouTube. Uh, he was starting to say goodbye uh, and that he loves everyone and, and that sort of thing because he couldn't, he couldn't get out of this situation. His, his arm was so lodged in so tightly but as, as the days went by and he was losing strength and losing water, he thought, no, there must be something I can do to get out of this because I'm going to die. I'm literally going to die. If I don't do something drastic, I'm going to die. And so he had a little bit of a, a small little pen knife in his pocket. And so he took out the pen knife and started cutting his arm. And he started cutting his arm. And obviously, you can just imagine the gruesomeness of the situation. I don't know how many of us here would have the guts even to do that. Some of us might just say, oh, I'm just going to let myself die. Uh, but he had the guts to do that. So he took out the knife and he started cutting his arm. And so eventually he was able to cut off his arm with blood and gore and everything else. And he, he got free of that. And somehow he bandaged his arm with the clothing he had and he stumbled his way out. And eventually he came across two other hikers and mountaineers and they managed to radio in some help. And yeah, Chopper came and picked him up. And yes, he, he lived and he's still alive today. And if you want to Google you can, or YouTube, you can find a video of him. But friends, just bear in mind, he had to take an extreme action because he knew that he was going to die. He knew that he was going to die. And as we carry on with the hard sayings of Jesus, and we look at tonight's particular hard saying, I think we'll find that today's saying is, is particularly hard because we love sin so much. If we were to be honest, myself including, we just love 
to sin all the time. And my prayer is that you will find the love of God so compelling, so compelling tonight that the pleasures of sin will pale in comparison compared, compared to the, the intimate relationship you can have with your Creator. And so let's go to Mark 9, 43 to 48. Uh, I've also put it up on the screen as well, but if you brought a Bible, please turn with me to Mark 9, 43 to 48, and this is what Jesus says. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Such strong words from Jesus. And he seems to be something, saying something really strong because at, at first glance, it seems to be saying that if members of your body, like your arm or, or your limbs or your eyes, is causing you to sin, then you need to cut out those limbs or those arms and gouge out your eyes. And as I look around, I don't think any of us has taken that command seriously because none of you came in wheelchairs. And as, I, as far as I can see, your eyes are still intact. And so myself included, we have not taken that command seriously. And so as, as a sincere Christian, I really want to obey and take Jesus' command seriously. So I, I brought this. Uh, yeah, it's the only thing I found in the kitchen there at the back. And I thought we, we should be applying this, uh, what Jesus said. So uh, if you're really serious about following Jesus, then who would like to volunteer first? after me. Uh, I, I'll try. Um, but apparently no one literally wants to take Jesus seriously. Um, do you want me to have a go? Maybe, maybe I might be bold enough. I don't know. Um, shall I? <laughs> I'm going to do it. Okay, I won't. Uh, I won't, but, but that's what Jesus said. We just read that on the screen. So the question is, why don't we do it? If we're serious about following him, we laugh, but what is he saying? Is he trying to be symbolic? Do we just kind of ignore passages of scripture that we somehow find difficult to understand? That's the point of this, this whole series. What Jesus is doing here is he's using hyperbole. What that means is a hyperbole is an intentional overstatement. In other words, it's an over-exaggerated statement to highlight the seriousness of the point he's trying to make. Right? So sometimes we, we say this. When we're really, really hungry, we, said, we say, oh, I'm so hungry. If I don't eat now, I'm going to die. Okay? Now you know that you're not going to die if you don't eat right now. But you're, you're, you're trying to highlight the seriousness of your situation by saying you are going to die if you don't eat right now. In the same way, by saying this, Jesus is trying to highlight the seriousness of sin. He's trying to highlight the seriousness of of sin. And in order to understand and to comprehend this, we need to go right back to the beginning. Okay? So in Genesis 2.17, God says to Eve, after he had created Adam and Eve, he said, the day you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. Okay? So Adam and Eve, as we know the story, disobeyed God and ate of that fruit. But did they die instantly? We know that they didn't. But what happened was the process of dying started when they ate of that tree, when they rebelled against God, and eventually they would die. And every other human born after that would eventually die as well because death is a result of sin, friends. Apostle Paul says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. In other words, the final payment for sin is death, and that is why we die, in case you were wondering why we die. When did Adam and Eve exactly sin? Though? Was it when they actually ate the fruit? Was it uh, that point when they actually sin? Or was it when they decided in their hearts that they would willfully disobey and rebel against God and that being in communion with him was actually not good enough for him? That is when, when they actually sinned because the eating of the fruit, friends, was just the outward final action of the internal choice they had already made in their hearts. 
That's how sin happens. Adultery, for example, is just a final outward action of an internal choice that you've already made to lust after someone who is not your husband or wife because sin ultimately resides in our hearts. Sin ultimately resides in our hearts. And so that is why Jesus is always after our hearts. But what has that got to do with what Jesus is saying here tonight? We know that when we are, we are born in sin, we have the proclivity to sin. In other words, we are not born innocent and somehow the external influences around us cause us to sin. The external influences or the bad influences around us just brings out to the surface what's already there in our hearts. And we need to really grapple and understand that. In Psalm 51.5, David says, we are brought forth into the world in iniquity and in sin our mothers conceived us. So we are sinners not only from birth, but even from the time we have been conceived in the mother's womb. I can't stress that enough because if you don't get that, you will never appreciate the cross and what Jesus has done for you, friends. If you don't believe me, think about a baby and a toddler. I don't know how many of you have ever cuddled a little baby in your arm and this baby might be holding a toy that this baby really enjoys and is kind of playing with it. Try and take that toy away from that baby and see what that baby does. That baby screams and, and rides in sort of pain and anger. If that baby had the strength of an adult, God forbid what happens to you at that point in time. Right? So scripture testifies that we are indeed born in sin and that sin is not something that latches onto us somehow because of external uh, circumstances, but rather it's a very deep condition that we are born with. And that is why Jesus here is highlighting the seriousness of sin in our, in our passage tonight because it doesn't only lead to eternal death, but it separates us from God. And so the question is, are we going to separate ourselves from those things that cause us to sin or are we going to let those causes separate us from God? Because ultimately that is the choice here that we have. If we don't kill sin, sin will kill us. And Jesus has to use such vivid imagery, friends, to convey that point. Because what Jesus is saying here, friends, has implications to two kinds of people. Because in this world, there are only two kinds of people. There are those who are in Adam on the one side, and then there are those who are in Christ on the other side. And what I mean by that is those who are in Adam means those who are born into this world and they live a life, and they ultimately die without knowing God, without believing in Jesus. And so they are still in Adam, whereas those who are in Christ are those who are born in Adam, but have put their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and he's transferred them from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. He has saved them. And so what we're going to address tonight is these two groups of people, those who are in Adam and those who are in Christ. And you know, I believe, deep down in your hearts where you stand here tonight. And so, in terms of the people who are still in Adam, friends, I think this is what Jesus has to say to them based on what we just read. He says, your sin will kill you. Sounds harsh, but your sin will ultimately kill you because the entire Word of God testifies that, that every person who has ever been born starts off with being in Adam and you grow old, and eventually you die, but it does not end there because you spend the rest of eternity in a constant state of eternal death, separate from God. And the reason why we have to be separated from God in our sin is because he is the author of life, and he's so holy and pure and righteous that we cannot be with him in eternity. And so if you're still stuck in Adam, even after you die, you have to be separated from God. That is why Jesus is highlighting the, the seriousness of sins, friends. He's saying that sins isn't just the mistakes that we make or the wrong things that we do, but it's our ultimate form of rebellion in our hearts against God. And we know that deep down, all of us has an inkling of that right in our hearts. And so ultimately, when you die, when you're separated from God, you eventually get what you want. Because even during this lifetime, you wanted to be separated from God. You wanted rather the pleasures of sin rather than knowing and enjoying the pleasures of God. And so even when you die, you get what you want, friends. You get what you want. And that's why the imagery of cutting off body parts is hectic. I mean, some of you started squirming when I took that knife and it looked like I was going to do it. But Jesus said, if your, your right arm causes you to sin, cut it off. 
It is such a bloody thing to even contemplate. But that arm, think about it, if you cut off an arm, right, like, like that guy did um, when he was stuck in the mountains, that arm will eventually rot and die, right? That arm will just, uh, you know, disintegrate eventually, but you will still live. You will still live. You might be armless, but you are still going to live. That's the same thing with sin, friends. When you cut off sin or the causes, the power of it, it loses its power over you. If it's still attached to you, it will still have power over you. And this is what Jesus is trying to say, and that is why he says we need to cut off the causes of sin that cause us to sin. Because if we don't cut it off, it will continue to feed into us friends and ultimately we will die not just a physical death but tragically a spiritual death that lasts forever and those who are still in Adam friends I want to beg and implore you if you're seated here tonight if you're just doing religion every week just ticking off the religious box and if you hadn't actually put your faith in Jesus Christ your sin will kill you and that is what Jesus is trying to tell you tonight but there is always good news and you can ask the people in this room who have already given their lives to Jesus, who have put their faith in the cross. Jesus was killed for your sin. Jesus was killed for your sin. And those who are in Christ celebrate that every single day of their lives. And those who are yet who are not in Christ, your sin need not kill you, friends, because Jesus was killed for your sin. And when we delve deeper into that, we will celebrate him every single day you know, when Jesus came into the world, um, he was conceived in Mary's room by the Holy Spirit. And in Matthew 121 says, Jesus will save his people from their sins. So the only way that Jesus could save us from our sins, friends, is to be killed because of our sin. And that's what he did for us on the cross. Because to be in Christ is to recognize that Jesus was killed for your sin and took your place on that cross so that you don't have to be killed for your sin. If you get that, friends, you're going to party like we, like we spoke about in the first song, right? Because he took your place and was killed for your sin, you do not have to be, but you've got to accept and receive and believe in him because of that. Because for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, this hyperbole, this extreme statement of Jesus reminds us of what it costs to actually save us, but it's also a warning for us not to carry on indulging in those sins that we like to, but instead to cut them off because somehow they cause a separation between us and God. We're not able to have the kind of intimacy that we would want with him. You know, eternal separation does not await those who are in Christ. But if you don't cut out the causes of sin in this lifetime, you will lack joy. You're wondering why you're walking around as if you're sucking lemons the whole time. You will have no peace despite the storms in your life. You won't be satisfied irrespective of, of the friends or the things that you have around you because you're not celebrating the fact that Jesus was killed for your sin. To those who are in Christ, I want to ask, what are some of the causes of sin in your life? Is it a, perhaps a person? Or is it a group of people? Is it a friend? Perhaps it's even a significant other or an associate at work. That person and those people will cut off, friends, the greatest intimacy you can have with the one who loves you the most. What is it? Is it pornography? Is it substance abuse? Perhaps it's addictions. Some things like pornography, friends, will cut off true pleasure that can be found in Jesus and will give you false sinful pleasure. Addictions will cut off the thrill of walking with Jesus and give you thrills that will ultimately kill you on the inside because all those things are just feeding into your sinful nature if you don't cut them off. Jesus, friends, was saved, has saved you from the penalty of sin, but the power of sin might still be ruling in your life if you continue to feed it, if you continue to feed it. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, Paul says, you are not your own. In other words, our bodies are not our own. We were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And he's saying that if you are in Christ, you can no longer do what you want because your life was bought with the highest of prices. Jesus, the Son of God, was killed for your sin. And so your allegiance is no longer to your sin, but, but to him, friends. Whatever it is, please cut it off. Don't indulge it. Don't entertain it. 
because it's much easier to avoid temptation than to resist it, I can promise you that God's love for us on the cross should compel us to want to cut those things off. Jesus has to use extreme language, like cutting off your limbs and gouging out your eyes because it requires an extreme action on our part. We often talk about living a balanced life. That's what you hear from life coaches and gurus and all of those things. And in certain things, it's good to have a balanced life. Like for example, a diet. It's good to eat a balanced diet, proteins, carbs, whatever the case may be. I'm not an expert in those things. But when it comes to sin, there's no such thing as a balanced life, friends. We have to deal with it so vigilantly because Jesus was dealt with it vigilantly on the cross for our behalf. If the love of Jesus Christ, friends, on the cross does not compel you to cut off those causes of sin in your life, chances are perhaps you are still in Adam. Chances are you've actually not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. Therefore, the only solution, because there's only one solution, friends, for, for both groups, for those who are in Adam and for those who are in Christ, there is only one solution. Because for those who are in Adam, to gaze at the cross, when you look at the cross, means to recognize that your sin will ultimately kill you forever and you need to put your faith in the one who was killed for the penalty of your sin. And to those who are in Christ, to gaze at the cross, cross means to be grateful that your penalty was paid on the cross by Jesus, but that he also killed the wages of sin, which is death, by rising from the dead, friends, which then gives you the power to strive to live the life that is devoid of sin. We can never be in a life that is completely devoid of sin. We know that. But when we start identifying those things that causes us to sin, that causes that separation from God, that keeps you stuck in religiosity and not having joy in Christ, then we need to start taking drastic measures to cut those things off because you cannot negotiate with a killer. Ever tried? Ever seen those movies where they're trying to negotiate with killers? They can't. The killer is bent, is hell-bent on one intention and one purpose only, and that is to kill you. And that is to kill you. And so you've got to cut off any form of relationship and communication with that killer so that he has no access to you whatsoever. That is when you are safe from a killer. And that is when he cannot kill you. And some of you in the room might be thinking tonight, does that mean I should no longer be friends with non-Christians, for example? That is not what I'm saying, because otherwise how will they get to know the love of Jesus? What I'm saying, though, is that if they are causing you to sin, then maybe you ought to change the form or the dynamic of that relationship in such a way that they're no longer a cause to your sin. Think through it, friends. Just think through it. In our text tonight, Jesus mentions something that is not often talked about in pulpits because people don't really want to talk about it. And he talks about hell. Remember what he said. It is better to go into the kingdom of heaven with one arm than to go into hell with both your arms intact. And he says the same things with our eyes as well. Why, why is Jesus saying that, friends? Jesus talks about hell more than anyone else in Scripture. It's a fire that doesn't die. It is a place of God's judgment on sin. And God has to judge sin because he is a righteous and just God. There has to be justice. He cannot sweep it under the carpet. Otherwise, he wouldn't be just. Otherwise, I cannot trust a God who is not just. I cannot trust a corrupt God who just winks at sin and sweeps it under the carpet and says, it is okay. But because he's not only just but loving, please hear this tonight, friends. If you don't... If you've, been, if you've zoned off the whole sermon, please listen to his. He's, he's not just a just God in punishing sin, but he's a loving God in that he provides us a way out. And so on that cross, God's judgment on sin and his love for you is met on the cross of Jesus Christ. That is why the gospel is good news. And that is why we celebrate Jesus. And that is why we love him, because the justice of God and the love of God is met on the cross. Therefore, he offers his son as the one on whom the judgment of God is poured upon him. And Jesus takes hell on our behalf so that we don't have to. Whoever believes in Jesus' finished work on the cross does not have to suffer God's judgment on hell because Jesus took hell for you. Either you pay for your sins or Jesus pays for them on the cross. We always have a choice. I don't understand how people can reject this offer of love and and salvation and grace and mercy, but yet, unfortunately, many of us do. And I hope there isn't anyone in the room tonight who has rejected God's love on the cross for you, friends. Jesus has to use stark words of cutting off one's limbs and gouging out one's eyes 
because he knew that one day, not so far away, his own body would be beaten, would be battered, would be bruised, would be beaten and whipped so badly that it was irrecognizable. A crown of thorns would be placed on his head so that we do not have to suffer. So believe me, friends, the small little sacrifice of cutting off those things that cause us to sin is nothing compared to the sacrifice that our Savior paid on our behalf so that we don't have to be killed by sin eternally. Isn't that great news? I mean, come on, Christian, isn't that great news? That Jesus was killed for your sin, amen. You know that mountaineer I mentioned at the beginning had to cut off his arm because he knew he was going to die. And so if you're seated here tonight and you're not a Christian, you haven't put your faith in Jesus, death is imminent and you have to do something drastic and that thing drastic that you have to do is to put your faith in the one who was killed for your sin. And if you're a Christian here tonight, maybe you're indulging in sin and you, you don't even take it seriously because somehow you've seen God's grace on your life as cheap grace, as something that you can just take advantage of and continue to delve in. But Jesus, with his arms stretched wide on the cross, is saying, I was killed for your sin, so don't let that sin cause separation between you and me. He is saying that to you tonight, friends. Remember what he has done for you. John 15, uh, 1 to 2, this is what um, Jesus says. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, or cuts in other words, that it may bear much fruit. As, at first glance, friends, these words of Jesus might seem hard and a little bit difficult to digest. But think about the concept of pruning. Those of you who prune rose bushes, you don't just randomly cut off stuff um, on the rose bush, right? You cut off those things that need to be cut off, but they need to be cut off because otherwise the rose bloom will die and it won't grow. In the same age, this is what Jesus is trying to tell you because he has to cut off certain parts of you that are not bearing fruit. Why? So that you will bear more fruit. And this is such an encouragement to us because he's saying that you may bear more fruit. In other words, you're already bearing fruit. In other words, he's giving you a thumbs up and say, I am pleased, your life is bearing fruit but I need to cut off some of those things that aren't bear, bearing fruit so that you will bear more fruit in the same way that you do with a rose bush as well. If you're a believer and follower of Jesus, what is at least one cause of sin right now that the Holy Spirit is prompting you to cut off? Jesus was killed for that sin so that you could have eternal life. The least you could do is cut off that, the cause of that sin that comes between us and God. It will be painful. I can promise you it will be, but it will cause you to bear much fruit because for each and every one of us in this room, myself included, there is at least one thing. There is at least one thing. And if there isn't, then you're either lying to yourself or you're not in Christ in the first place, friends. To those in the room who are not believers and followers of Jesus, your sin will eventually kill you and that is the most loving thing either I or Jesus can tell you. And so the most drastic and liberating thing that you can do is to put your faith and hope in the one who was killed for your sin so that your sin can never separate you from God. The offer is always open and available to you. You just got to accept it and believe it and receive it by faith and your life will be changed forever. As I was studying this passage, it is a very difficult passage to, to try and, and, and even grasp and understand but Jesus, as we said in the beginning, is intentionally using an overstatement to highlight, to, to exaggerate the seriousness of sin because sin caused the Son of God to come into the world and be killed for our sins so that our sin can no longer have dominion and power over us. And so I'm praying that the Holy Spirit has been convicting you of what those things are. Are they particular things? Uh, perhaps it's, it's lust of money. Perhaps it's, it's lust of, of other people, pornography, addictions. Perhaps it's even your job or your work at varsity. You're so obsessed that you made it a little idol, a little God in your life, and thereby putting Jesus on the background. Perhaps you need to pay a little more attention, a little less attention to your job and more attention on Jesus. Perhaps it's even a close family member 
No one is saying you mustn't work hard in your job. No one is saying you mustn't work hard to get good varsity marks. But if those things actually causes you to sin, in other words, you're putting an idol in your life in, instead of Jesus, that in the throne of your life, those things are taking far more precedence than the one who was killed for your sin, then perhaps we need to examine and change the dynamic of the way we live life. The Holy Spirit has been convicting me of, of some of those things that, that I need to, 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 to change in my life so that I'm not allowing anything to come in between me and Christ. Yes, my, my eternity is secure. Yes, my future is secure. Yes, I know where I'm going to go when I die. But while I am still alive, there are things that I need to cut off, things that are causing me to sin. You know, the greatest thing that I'll be excited about when I, when I die and get to heaven is not heaven itself, but I'll be excited that I'll be stopped sinning. I'll be excited that I'm not disappointing my Savior no longer. I'll be excited that I'll be given this resurrected body by Jesus that no longer craves sin, but rather is just pleased with just being Him, being with Him and Him alone. That is what I'm most looking for when I get to heaven. And so that is, that is my prayer for you tonight is that as Jesus has highlighted the seriousness of sin, there is something more greater than sin itself, and that is Him and Him alone. And the pleasures of knowing Him and walking in intimacy with Jesus is much greater than the fleeting pleasures of sin that are slowly killing you on the inside. Let's close our eyes for a moment. Father, we thank You so much for, for Your love for us. We thank You that You love us enough just to, not to, just to tell us nice words that we want to hear with our ears, but you want to pierce straight into our hearts because you desire to be in absolute communion and fellowship and relationship with us. Lord Jesus, we know that sin is so serious that it caused you to come and die for that sin. And so for those who are in the room tonight, Lord, who are still in Adam, perhaps their whole life they thought they are Christians, but have never actually believed in the cross, never believed that you've, killed, you've been killed for the penalty of their sin. May tonight be the night where they make that change. May tonight be the night that they put their faith in Jesus. And for those of us who are in Christ tonight, Lord, perhaps we've indulged in sin too much. Perhaps we, we've lost the concept of how serious it is. And Holy Spirit, show us in our hearts what we need to cut off in our lives. Those things that are so connected to us that they still have power over us. Holy Spirit, Give us the strength to cut those things off as painful as it might be. When that mountaineer recognized, Lord, that he was going to die, he took an extreme measure. And I pray that if there are, there are some of us in this room, Lord, who need to take extreme measures, may they have the boldness and the courage to do that tonight. And may we celebrate Jesus because we have such an amazing eternity to look forward to. An eternity full of the joys and the pleasures of of knowing God and being with God, an eternity that is devoid of sin completely. And so I give us the power to celebrate and worship you tonight. We give you praise in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. We're going to close in worship. We're going to sing a couple of songs. And as you sing the songs, just celebrate Jesus because I'm so thankful that he was killed for our sin so that we don't have to be killed by our sin ultimately. Let's stand together and worship Jesus.